Welcome back. Today, we are talking with Ed Conley, the author of Promote the Dog Sitter and Other Principles for Leading During Disasters. Ed, great first segment. Thanks very much. Um, now, I want to touch on something that you mentioned in the book. And as you were talking, it actually got me thinking about some of the bits in the book that I read about. You talk about showing up versus showing off. What did you mean by that? Well, uh, let me start here, Alex. So um, I, I'm a big believer that if you're going to work in emergency management, if you're going to work in the disaster business, that it's important to have a set of core values, a set of principles uh, that that you believe in with all your heart that's going to help you uh, make uh, uh, difficult decisions in tough circumstances. And, and my first one, and maybe my most important one, is what I call showing up, the showing up principle. So when, you know, it's interesting, you know, we toss a lot of words at people uh, when we give advice, right? We, uh, we tell them, um, oh, you should be authentic. Uh, you should be a uh, vulnerable. And we tell a lot of people you should show up, make sure you show up. But what I'm interested in, well, uh, what does that mean for, for an emergency manager, right? So my methodology for evaluating core principles uh, like show up is, is first of all, I want to know, you know, uh, what does that mean? You know, can we define it? Why is it important? And then how the heck do I do it? How do I show up? What do I avoid doing? And then the last part for any core principle, and, and perhaps especially for the show up principle is, does it have a transformational value? Um, can it can it mean something bigger than this one disaster? Can it propel me in my career? Can can it allow me to make a difference uh, in the industry? And so that's my five uh, 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 my five um, uh, methodology methodology aspects for evaluating different core principles. So let's so showing up to me um, was. Um, I really uh, evaluated from three things. Was I on scene? Was I on scene when the disaster struck? Did I, could, was I walking through the rubble? Could I smell the smoke? Um, could I see the destroyed homes and the damaged community, and the impacts of that, that event? Was I on scene? That was number one. Number two for me was, um, was I interacting with people who'd been uh, personally impacted by the event? Um, you know, part a big part of my job between disasters was always talking to other FEMA people, right? Well, that should be flipped uh, on a disaster. I should be should be spending, in my mind, I should be spending more time talking to people who had been impacted, and building relationships uh, with nonprofit organizations and uh, the volunteers and the local community and state and everybody else who's involved with it. People outside my organization. So that was number two. Um, uh, my number two metric in determining whether I showed up. And then number three was, did I have a specific assignment, right? Was I responsible and accountable for getting a portion of the mission done? It didn't matter how big, it didn't matter what my title was, but was I was I going to be held accountable for something? So if I met those three criteria on scene, um, uh, engaging and talking and meeting with people who have been impacted and accountable for getting something done uh, as a result of that disaster. And in, in my book, I showed up and, mm -hmm. and that's how I evaluated it for myself. And that's how I, and that's how I look at it when I'm evaluating uh, other people show up. So a lot of people uh, talk about showing up uh, a lot of people uh, at, and, and I saw this a lot sometimes in FEMA who talked about showing up, um, but they didn't really meet any of that criteria. They were more disaster tourists. They'd pop in for a week and sort of hang out, roam around, take a look at the stuff, go home, and then put it on the resume that it showed the disaster. And so I have a little bit stricter uh, criteria in my book uh, for showing up. Now, I think the reason it's so important is because I don't know how you can work in this business um, and learn what this job's all about and and attempt to make a difference if you don't show up, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how 
how can you be in emergency management and then you just always stay in your office um, and uh, attend meetings and, and talk about concepts and theories, but when something actually happens, you don't go to the field. Uh, so that for, I just think it's just critical um, that you have you have that show up personality that you've adopted that that uh, commitment as part of who you are as an emergency manager. You, and you don't have to show up every time. It's not like you know you're constantly out the door and everything. But if you're going to work in this business at critical times, and you'll recognize it, you know, no one needs to tell you there are going to be critical times where you need to show up and you need to be on scene, you need to be engaging people impacted and you need to be accountable for something uh, on that disaster. And I just found that people who who dedicate this, uh, dedicate to showing up and recognize the importance of it, value it in themselves and value it in others. Uh, those are the people who tend to make the long-term impacts in our industry. Uh, there tend to be people who rise to the top they tend to be the people who are most influential uh, emergency management. They tend to be the people who are respected um, and can set trends and to create progress in, in advancing the goals of emergency management. Um, because I think that uh, they have that credibility uh, because they've, they've walked the talk. But I think beyond the credibility, they've de demonstrated the passion and the reason we do that. And... Uh, to be uh, to be there when it matters most. So is a show off the opposite? And show off is the opposite, right? So show show off is uh, showing off. Uh, the showing off principle is uh, lots of people uh, confuse that as showing up, but showing off is when you um, you exaggerate your involvement in the industry. Um, and you make you make it all about you and your ego and your parking spot and uh, oh. your title and your your office uh, and everything else. And uh, so that's the showing off. You you're, you're more worried about your press uh, coverage and your clippings than you are whether the information that's being distributed is accurate and helpful for people. Um, so you can always distinguish between who. I, I can anyway, because I pay attention to it, Alex, and I'm always watching it on, on television when disaster strikes you. Okay, who, who's who's showing up here and uh, who's showing off here? It kind of uh, got me thinking that sometimes when there are the uh, an oil spill or something like that, and you have all these celebrities show up, well, then to me, they're kind of showing off because all the coverage about the actual disaster and the emergency disappears, and it's all about, you know, the celebrity and what they were doing. You know, it's like, you know, get out of the way. You're causing more issues than you are helping. And to me, right. that that's what I was thinking um, when I read that section uh, as an example is that's kind of showing off. To me, after reading your section, I'm going, that's kind of showing off. They're not really showing up to do anything. They're showing up for, for publicity, which means they're showing off. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, I think you can really identify a, a show up for show off is, is uh, yeah, show one shows up for, for their ego, right? Yeah. Uh, someone sh who is showing off is, uh, yeah, for, for their publicity and for, um, um, you know, to, to put uh, something nice in their resume um, yeah. or someone who's, you know, just consumed with, you know, what their title is. Uh, on it and whether they're going to get an SUV and a driver or, you know, those, those non-important things. Uh, I always distinguish it. Now, I, um, you know, it's interesting that you talk about uh, celebrities. So, uh, and that is, uh, that is an interesting factor in disasters. Now, I think one, one approach uh, for celebrities and a lot of celebrities I saw this the other day. I saw a really interesting uh, YouTube analysis of celebrities on disasters. And, you know, a lot of celebrities, uh, especially the most famous ones, tend to think of themselves as almost as world leaders. They think of themselves as, you yeah, know, yeah. Th they have a real inflated sense of their importance and uh, everything else. But I think you can leverage their engagement and interest in the disaster. Um uh, to, to turn them in from uh, show off observers to uh, show up participants. 
um, as long as you have a, a way to channel their interest uh, in the right way and have a specific ask. But it, it's just, I just think it's just, uh, it's just a really um, interesting to me, Alex, and looking throughout the history of disasters and the history of crisis and, um, and what's uh, a common reason for operational failure or disaster failure and you know more often than not it's ego than anything else it's mm -hmm. it's usually not a lack of resources um it's usually not uh um uh, incomplete legislation or organizational structure or any other things that you think would be the key components uh, causing failure lots of times it's too many too many people are there to show off um and and more concerned about their ego and ego protection than the mission focus and uh and that's the reason a lot of disasters fail more than anything else in my opinion well there's there was something else to to carry on from what you just said there that uh, leaders during a disaster or crisis have three choices to make that uh blame hide or own can you talk about that because i thought that was an interesting piece as well um yeah, so, so think I think about it, and here's an exercise um, that I encourage people to do. Um, you know, watch a crisis unfold on TV, and and look at who, uh, look at the, the 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 role that different leaders are playing, or that you expect leaders to play, right? Whether what you expect the the role the, of the mayor to play, or the the company CEO to play, or the governor or the president. And and usually you can identify. Usually you find that they've made one of three choices. Um, they even they either have chosen to hide from the disaster, and uh, the way you can identify someone hiding from the disaster is if you can define their response with a word beginning with D. So they're just they've disappeared. You know where the heck are they? Uh, yeah. They're deflecting responsibility. Uh, they're denying that um, uh, that uh, they have uh, they're accountable for anything. Um, uh, that they're deflecting anything with the D is usually uh, you can uh, tag that with with uh, with the leader. Then you got your hider. Then the blamers are those that um, for some reason you know that the event's too big with them or. They feel that this is how leaders react. Um, they're looking at who to blame mm -hmm. for it. They're looking at, um, they're pointing out all the problems and how other people have failed, how other organizations have failed, how different levels of, of, of government may have failed, or, how, or even people within the organizations and they do that publicly, right? They're, they're blaming, they're, they're trying to distance themselves from accountability. Um, uh, and trying to place all the all the accountability in someone else. So you have the blamers. And then, you know, the final one is obviously the best one and the one I love, the one I I embrace, and the one I've seen great leaders embrace, and that's owning chip. That's owning it. And the interesting thing about owners, Alex, is um you have people who just say, okay, yeah, this is this is my job. I'm gonna do my best. And then you have uh, those are good owners, and then you have people who um, who say that and act and demonstrate that. Um, okay, you know, I'm I'm taking charge of this. I'm going to stand up. Um, I'm going to be held accountable. I'm willing to ex accept that. Um, it, you know, it's my turn. It's my time. Um, and then you have the very best of all, right? You have uh, people who they're galloping to the head of the line. They um, they have recognized that this is a legacy moment for them. This is their moment in history. This is maybe what they were born to do. At this moment, uh, there's no place else in the world they'd rather be. They want to be in this event. They want to own it. Be, uh, they want to try to make a difference. They believe that they can make a difference. And um, throughout history, we've seen some incredible examples of that sort of personality of that sort of people um you know it, uh you know winston churchill during world war ii um and a lot of you know we forget uh because he's become such a 
complicated, distracting character in American politics, but Giuliani during 9-11, mm -hmm. um, I think was a significant uh, person who just charged into that event. Uh, I thought the prime minister of New Zealand during COVID did an incredible job. She did an incredible job. Um, and, uh, you know, Nancy Ward, when she ran FEMA and Craig Fugate and James Sweet, they had that sort of personality and mayors like Pat Owens and Grand Forks and Dennis Walker and Fargo and uh, the team in Mississippi, the leadership team in Mississippi during Katrina, which in Mississippi went really well though and during Katrina. People forget that. But they had that sort of charge and that enthusiasm um, for that moment to be there and to be a part of that and to make a difference. So, um, what, so the, you know, so when you talk about leadership and you're recognizing the three roles, uh, the three the characteristics that you'll see um, leaders take, three choices that they're faced with, um, it's interesting how many times uh, you can spot that mm -hmm. if you think through it. How many times, well, there's a hider right there, you know? Uh, well, there's a blamer. I got we got a blamer on this one, um, and there's an owner. When I think of the blamers, uh, because we're seeing that in politics and government and some organizations right now, I also think that they are uh, following what you said, one of those D words. You know, they're trying to disappear so that everyone's looking somewhere else, you know, and deflect. You know, don't look at the issues that we may have caused. You know, we're, we're going to yell and blame somebody else. So go over there. You know, go 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 bug them, go go see them, so that then I can disappear. You know, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, uh, um, I, I, yeah, and you know, once I, once I, um, you know, kind of thought through this and explored it and kind of identified those three labels, I see it all the time, just like you, Alex. Uh, now, I, um. I, you know, one point I do try to make is that um, an owner is not, an owner is an optimist, usually an optimist. Uh, I'd say always an opt optimistic, but they're also a realist, right? They, um, you know, being an owner does not mean that there are heated arguments behind the scenes, that there, that um, you need to challenge, that you need to hold other people on your team accountable that there are going to be disagreements. Um, uh, all that is very important to the ownership approach to leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just behind the scenes, right? It's just, uh, you're still, you, you know, you work through those things, but then when, you know, once you've made a decision, then yeah, you come out uh, one team. But it does not mean that <clears throat> it's a Pollyanna approach and that everything's going to be great. We're all happy and all that. No, it's it's still being honest about the challenges. It still means working through difficult situations. It still means that there are going to be disagreements <laughs> and arguments and 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 different uh, philosophies on approaches to deal with the consequences of event. It just means that you're willing to uh, accept and own the decision once it's made. Right. Well, we've only got about five minutes left. So I've got to ask you this question because it's not the typical uh, book title that you would think when you're talking about disasters. Um, promote the dog sitter. Can you explain where that comes from? The the title of my book is Promote the Dog Sitter. So that that title comes from a story from uh, the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York. And during the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York, I was part of the uh, media affairs team we're supporting the search and rescue effort at Ground Zero. We were based at the Javits Center where all the federal search and rescue teams were, were based. That was the staging area for them at the Javits Center, Javits Convention Center in New York. <clears throat> and we, uh, our job was to help uh, handle the international media interest and the international celebrity interest in the search and rescue effort at Ground Zero. Um, the uh, the number one topic of interest from across the globe were the dogs, <laughs> and um, and you know thinking back and you know why were the dogs? I I just think it was such a diff such a difficult event to comprehend. It was so terrifying. Um, 
and what was going on, what what was happening to our world. I think the dogs gave uh, people something to sort of maybe identify with, connect with. Uh, the dogs were were somewhat reassuring. They're positive. They were, I don't know. I, I think people just connected with the dogs and it just attracted attention throughout the world. So it, it almost overwhelmed us because there's so much interest in it. So we figured, well, we need someone to help manage this, right? We need someone to be kind of the subject matter expert on the search dog. So we, we just kind of picked this guy named Doug Walty and uh, Doug, uh, Doug was, um, you know, we, we knew him, but uh, no one knew much about him. Um, uh, we just had a feeling he might be the right guy. Um, he wasn't a big, he didn't have a big title. He wasn't real famous in the industry. We just had a feeling the right guy. And well, he stepped up to that moment in history and just did an amazing, amazing job. He just embraced the job 100%. He never slept. He got to know every dog. He knew their breeding, yeah. their name, their their parents' names. Um, uh, he knew their dog handlers' names. He knew everything about it. And he, he just helped educate the world um, about the, the search dogs and the role of the search dogs. <laughs> and um, uh, he made a tremendous contribution, Alex, to that particular disaster, um, but beyond that, he made incredible uh, contribution to the emergency management industry and maybe even beyond the emergency management industry. I've had people tell me that as a result of the publicity that Doug Walty generated for the search dogs in 9-11, that was really a milestone event in people recognizing the value of therapy dogs at schools, hmm. nursing homes, and hospitals. And that was really where that all started from. Uh, people saw the role the dogs were playing in 9-11. Um, he, he used the uh, interest in the dogs to help educate um, the nation and Congress on the value of search and rescue teams. And, and that re resulted in, in more congressional funding for the teams, uh, donations to search dog foundations, and, and helped really build a foundation uh, for search teams that um that has just they've saved thousands of lives as a result of that event and then uh and then he educated people that uh, these federal search and rescue teams are really locally based teams right they're just firefighters and doctors and structural engineers and and, and paramedics from local communities that work full time in their profession but they're pre-certified as a federal resource that the uh, FEMA can draw on when a disaster strikes and deploy them as a team when they come back and they do the regular job. So he 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 educated on how important those were in the local communities. And that generated more support um, uh, for the uh, search and rescue capabilities of the local community, which has made an incredible contribution in terms of live saves uh, for disasters throughout the last couple of decades. So that's the story behind the title. Why I loved it so much is, first of all, I thought it was kind of a cool title, but also I thought that Pierce was an under overlooked, underestimated person who became a leader mm -hmm. um, and seized a showed up and seized a moment and, and made a contribution, which kind of is an overarching theme of the book, right? Yeah. That uh, leaders emerge sometimes from people you least expect. Um, and it's people who are just primed and ready for that moment and step up and deliver. Yeah, you don't have to have a fancy title to be a leader. We've come to the end of the show. Ed, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on the book, Promote the Dog Sitter. I enjoyed it. And as anyone who can see the video, I have a lot of dog-eared pages with things that I thought were, oh, that's cool, and things I wanted to ask you about. And we only touched on one or two questions in our agenda, <laughs> which is fine by me. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your time and your stories. I really appreciate it. Alex, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed our conversation. My pleasure. And everyone watching and listening, stay prepared, everybody. If you like that video, thumbs up. If you didn't like that video, thumbs down. But leave me a message and let me know your thoughts. Of course, don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, Stay prepared, everybody.